Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Adventist Church, and this particular series is on the book of Daniel. This is the lesson number eight from that series for February 23 of 2020, and it covers a very important chapter, Daniel 7 primarily. It's entitled, From the Stormy Sea to the Clouds of Heaven. Wow, that sounds like quite a trick, doesn't it? As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we bow before you now, recognizing your presence with us and asking for your Holy Spirit's guidance as we study this very important material. May we see here what you want us to see. May we come to draw, to come, may we draw nearer to you in our discussions is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Daniel 7. What comes to your mind when you think of Daniel 7? There's two main parts of this chapter. There's those crazy beasts, and then there's a judgment scene. So we'll see how those two are related, how we can put them together. Are they supposed to be related? Well, like Daniel 2 and Daniel 8 that we'll study later, Daniel 7 is a prophecy talking about kingdoms and long time periods looking forward into the future. Now, if you remember what it says in Isaiah 50, you know, 40 to 55, it says, what kind of person is a God? He can create out of nothing. He can create out of nothing. And he predicts the future far in advance. He predicts the future far in advance, okay? So that's what we're talking about here. The vision was given to Daniel during the first year of Belshazzar's reign as co-regent with his father. Now, last week we talked about something that happened during the reign of Darius the Mede, which was several years after this one. So we're going back in time in terms of the giving of this prophecy. Yeah, about 15 years. Yeah. So um, Daniel was living in the kingdom of Babylon, which was the first major world-dominating power. But he was told about several other kingdoms which were to follow. In this vision, we see strange creatures, some of which look like known animals rising out of a sea tossed by winds from every direction. A dark sea may remind us of creation. The animals which appear are unclean, by Hebrew standards, and are hybrid. In other words, they're not like, completely like any known animals. No animals exactly like these have ever existed in the real world. Well, like the different metals in Daniel 2 vision, these animals represent powers that would dominate the world for centuries to come. God's domination of the world, would, which he gave to Adam in the Garden of Eden, uh, had by then turned into something very different. But in the middle of Daniel 7, we can see that a change will eventually come. God will re-enter the human arena and eventually will return the control of this world to his faithful followers. A heavenly judgment will bring that about. So we have here, if you are looking in, a, a chart that compares the prophecy. We're not going to spend a long time on it. The prophecies of Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 and Daniel 8. And we see that there are very significant parallels going on here. If you don't have this chart in front of you or you're just listening to it uh, without the visual part, you can look at our website at theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Look for the series on, of Sabbath School lessons on Daniel and turn to lesson number eight. So there's Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and the divisions of Greece, and then there's Rome, and there's the divisions of Rome, Papal Rome, and the pre-advent judgment of the kingdom of God. So, And you can see all the details there of the different parts and how carefully these things line up. So after he saw this amazing vision, Daniel hastened to ask one of the beings in his vision to explain things. That's reasonable, doesn't it sound to you? Mm -hmm. That will help us to understand what is happening. It is by charting the different visions and comparing Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8 that we can piece together a fairly detailed explanation of what was coming in the future in Daniel's day. And I might add, we're going to find out in this series of lessons that a few words can make a real difference in how you understand these passages. I found out that some translators follow one line of 
thinking and other translators following a different line of thinking and both are possible but there's clearly an emphasis in one direction and we'll have to look at that very carefully. Well the first three animals that Daniel saw coming up out of the windswept sea resemble known creatures. There was a lion, a bear, and a leopard. These were all animals familiar to people living in the Middle East at that time. However, the fourth creature was like nothing that anyone had ever seen. That beast had ten horns. Do we know any animals with ten horns? No. We know sharks with hundreds of teeth, but well, they, that beast had ten horns and looked powerful, horrible, and terrifying. It had huge iron teeth with which it crushed its victims and then trampled on them. And then, surprisingly, a small horn seemed to erupt and tore out three of the other horns from their roots. However, this horn was quite different, having human eyes and a mouth that was boasting proudly and saying terrible things against God. Winged lions decorated the palace of Babylon, so lions were an appropriate symbol of Babylon. The bear with three bones in his mouth represented the Medo-Persian Empire. One side of the bear was raised up higher than the other, indicating the superiority of the Persians over the Medes. During its years of conquest, the Medo-Persian Empire conquered the Lydian Empire in western Turkey, the Babylonian Empire, and that's the one we know the most about from the Bible, and in turn, Egypt. So the Greek Empire was represented by a leopard with wings. That would certainly suggest the speed with which Alexander the Great conquered the no known world. How long did it take him? I don't know. Yeah, about three years. Oh, Whoa. That dreadful and terrible animal with its multiple horns and its cruel and rapacious behavior clearly applies to the pagan papal empire which conquered, ruled, and trampled the world with its feet. Now we need to be clear and recognize that biblical critics, of course, have tried to suggest that the book was not written by Daniel, but by someone in the days of the Maccabeans after most of this history had taken place. There are many reasons why this cannot be true. The language used in this language of, Aram of Aramaic is the language of Aramaic used in the days of Daniel. If you no look at the very carefully, the Aramaic changes over a period of time, just as English changes over a period of time, and the Aramaic in the book of Daniel is the Aramaic from Daniel's day. Furthermore, Jesus himself said that portions of Daniel's prophecies were still future in his days. Let me read a couple of examples. Matthew 24, 15, you will see the awful horror of which the prophet Daniel spoke. You will be standing, uh, it will be standing in the holy place. Note to the reader, be sure to understand what this means. So, what does that tell us? It's future, it's future right? Mm -hmm. Look at Mark 13, 14. You will see the awful horror standing in the place where he should not be. Note to the reader, be sure to understand what this means. Then those who are in Judea must run away to the hills. So, is that still future? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thus, thousands of years of human history were predicted and have taken place exactly as predicted. Hmm, what does that tell us? Dennis? In the annals of human history, the growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires, appear as dependent on the will and prowess of man. The shaping of the event seems to a great degree to be determined by his power, ambition, or caprice. But in the word of God, the curtain is drawn aside, and we behold, uh, behind, above, and through all the play and counterplay of human interests and power and passions, the agencies of the all-merciful one, silently, patiently working out the counsels of his own will. Alan White, Education 173.2. I don't know if it grabs you like it grabs me, but think of that, that contrast there. Human beings think that they're doing what they want to do. They're doing all sorts of crazy things, and yet somehow behind this, God is working out His will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How does He do that through all of their craziness? Amazing. Well, the little horn power appeared for the first time in Daniel 7, and we're going to talk about the little horn power for a while, several, several weeks now. Jackie? And this is Daniel 7, verses 7 and 8, and 19 to 25. As I was watching, a fourth beast appeared. 
It was powerful, horrible, terrifying. With its huge iron teeth, it crushed its victims, and then it would trample on them. Unlike the other bees, it had ten horns. While I was staring at the horns, I saw a little horn coming up among the others. It tore out three of the horns that were already there. This horn had human eyes and a mouth that was boasting proudly. Then I wanted to know more about the fourth beast, which was not like any of the others. The terrifying beast which crushed its victims with its bronze claws and iron teeth and then trampled on them. And I wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and the horn that had come up afterwards and had made three of the horns fall. It had eyes and a mouth and was boasting proudly. It was more terrifying than any of the others. While I was looking, that horn made war on God's people and conquered them. Then the one who had been living forever came and pronounced judgment in favor of the people of the supreme God. The time had arrived for God's people to receive royal power. This is the explanation I was given. The fourth beast is a fourth empire that will be on the earth and will be different from all the other empires. It will crush the whole earth and trample it down. The ten horns are ten kings who will rule that empire. Then another king will appear. He will be very different from the earlier ones and will overthrow three kings. He will speak against the supreme God and oppress God's people. He will try to change the religious laws and festivals, and God's people will be under his power for three and a half years. Okay, I want you to notice something that, w back at verse 24 that Jackie just read. Then another king will appear. This is parallel to the little horn, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. After the ten kings, right? Mm -hmm. After the ten horns. So this has to be even further down line, further in the future. Mm -hmm. You can't go back like many of the biblical criti critics want to do and say, no, this is something that happened back before Jesus' day. Well, if you, if you do that, you're saying, of course, that Daniel's a liar, that even the people, supposedly, the person they thought who wrote the book of Daniel would, would have written it 160 years before Jesus, and he's still talking about something that happens after the Roman Empire is, is, is knocked down and the Ten Kingdoms replaced it, placed, and then there's, so. Yeah, that 24th verse just doesn't fit. Yeah. Only well, can fit in the future. Yeah, well, many of them, instead of, uh, uh, I think the, what we would call the Roman, they're, they're saying that that, that was uh, Greece. And uh, divide the, the uh, Okay, and Every, so, all of them up differently than we would, but I'm not excusing them. I'm just saying that that's how they. Yeah, and there's no way you can have ten new kingdoms arriving rising out of Greece. It just doesn't fit. There's nothing that matches that. Nothing that matches. I mean, there's three generals right after that. But. Yeah, and to emphasize why they do that, it's because they don't believe that even God can predict the future. Right. No, that's so right. it has Daniel has to have been written later, and has to be about things that have already happened. Those or are things that were happening at that time, possibly. A lot of those that think that were called process theologians. Yeah. They can't imagine that, God, that you're free to make decisions if God already knows what's going to happen. He he's must be manipulating somehow. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's important to know that this <coughs> little horn arises on the head of the ferocious beast that we know represents pagan Rome. So we would expect this little horn to carry on some of the characteristics of pagan Rome itself. This little horn is described in the following words. It will... It will speak pompous words against the Most High. And second, it will persecute the saints of the Most High. Three, intend to change times and law. And as the consequence, the saints would be given into his hand. Next, the angel gives the time frame for the activities of this little horn, a time and times and a half time. In this instance of prophetic language, the word time means year, and so the expression times signifies years, a dual form, two years. Hence, this is a period of three and a half prophetic years, which according to the year day 
according to the year-day principle, indicates a period of 1260 days, years. Can I interrupt for just a second? Yeah. In Hebrew, there's a certain form for singular. There's another form of the verb, of the, of the noun for dual, two. And then there's another form for three or more. So this is a dual form here, so we're talking about two years. So that's Times, yeah, times and time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anyway, for 1260 years, during this time, the little horn will mount an attack against God, persecute the saints, and attempt to change God's law. This is from the Adult Sabbath School Lesson Bible Study Guide for Monday, February 17. Okay, so in New Testament times, Paul must have known of the prophecy of Daniel and studied it in detail in his early years. Quite likely that he had memorized it, as a matter of fact. Read 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 12. Uh, and I'm going to take a moment to read a few of those verses. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to be with him, I beg you, my brothers and sisters, not to be so easily confused in your thinking or upset by the claim that the day of the Lord has come. Perhaps it is thought that we said this while prophesying or preaching or that we wrote in a letter. Do not let anyone deceive you in any way, for the day will not come until the final rebellion takes place and the wicked one appears, who is destined for hell. He will oppose every so-called God or object of worship and will put himself above them all. He will even go in and sit down in God's temple and claim to be God. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Mm -hmm. Paul described a power which he called the wicked one, who is to oppose every so-called God or object of worship, and will put himself above them all. He will even go in and sit down in God's temple and claim to be God. Does that sound at all like a horn that's speaking blasphemous words against God? Mm -hmm. So this wicked one will claim to perform miracles and wonders and use every kind of wicked deceit on those who will perish. Strangely, God sends the power of evil, uh, I'm sorry, of error, to work in those who choose to follow this beast, this wicked one, and thus have believed what is false. What do you suppose that means? God sends the power of error to work in those who choose to follow this beast? Does God ever do that kind of stuff? Whose he words permits. are those? God it permits. That, that, who, who wrote that? Paul. Well, yeah, there's got to be another way to word that. Well, I think when <clears> people, when they reject God's words over and over and over, yeah. what's God going to do? Let you let you do your thing. Then yeah, the God just says, well. Yeah. He allows can, us to go our way. Yeah. Yeah. He allows yeah. us to go our way. He has to allow that in light of his freedom, the necessity for freedom, and freedom is necessary or there can't be any love. Romans 1, 18, 24, 26, and 28. Yeah. Along with their leader, those people will be condemned. Well, in the central portion of Daniel 2, <coughs> now we're moving on to the next section, we read these words. So Daniel 7, 9 to 10, and 13 to 14 says, While I was looking, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever sat down on one of the thrones. His clothes were white as snow, and his hair was like pure wool. Hey, his can I interrupt for just a second? Who, there's only one person who could possibly qualify for that. Who would that be? Christ. Well, God the Father. Well, God. One of the members of God. It may be God, God the, the Father. Father. Go ahead. His throne, mounted on fiery wheels, was blazing with fire, and a stream of fire was pouring out of it. There were many thousands of people there to serve him, and millions of people stood before him. The court began its session, and the books were opened. During this vision in the night, I saw what looked like a human being. He was approaching me, surrounded by clouds. And he went to the one who had been living forever and was presented to him. He was given authority, honor, and royal power so that the people of all nations, races, and languages would serve him. His authority would last forever and his kingdom would never end. That's the Good News Bible. That's why I said that description, the previous paragraph, yeah. seems like it's God the Father. Yeah. With yeah. Jesus yeah, as a this, yeah. son of man comes. Yeah. yeah. Thrilling to think that he was born a human in our world 
and stays that way. Yep. In order to identify this little horde and power, it is very important to recognize that three times in this vision, Daniel saw a sequence. One, the little horn phase. We believe that's from 538 to 1798. We'll see about that a little bit later. Two, there's a heavenly judgment. And three, God's eternal kingdom is established. As a result of this heavenly judgment and the reestablishment of God's eternal kingdom, God's people will be reestablished as rulers on earth. Of course, they will do so under the leadership of Jesus Christ himself. So, repeating Daniel 7, 13 and 14 and then going to other verses. During this vision in the night, I saw what looked like a human being. He was approaching me, surrounded by clouds, and he went to the one who had been living forever and was presented to him. He was given authority, honor, and royal power so that the people of all nations, races, and languages would serve him. His authority would last forever, and his kingdom would never end. Going to verse 21. While I was looking, that horn made war on God's people and conquered them. Then the one who had been living forever came and pronounced judgment in favor of the people of the supreme God. The time had arrived for God's people to receive royal power. Jumping to verse 26. Then the heavenly court will sit in judgment, take away his power, and destroy him completely. The power and greatness of all the kingdoms on earth will be given to the people of the supreme God. Their royal power will never end, and all, all rulers on earth will serve and obey him. No, obey them. Him. Them. Sorry. Okay. Judgments are something that happen fairly frequently in Scripture. But this one is different. How is it different? This is a judgment that takes on cosmic proportions. Now, in my Good News Bible, it talks about millions of people gathered around. Other versions, it says different kinds of beings. Who was, who's gathered around in the, the judgment here? Angels. The angels. Hundred million angels are gathered observing what's going on here around God's throne. So where is that judgment located? Is that in New York City or Washington, D.C. or Paris or London? No. It's in heaven. This is a, this is a universal yeah. thing. Shouldn't that verse 27 say obey him, him rather than them? Well, it says they will be given power to rule with him. Their and royal says, power will, will never end, and all rulers on earth will serve and obey them. But, but if it you go like back it up, him. Um, New American Standard says him, so says him. not everybody translates it the same. There seems like good news misses the mark when it talks about human beings up there too. Rather, but than look, look at verse thousands of angels. Look at verse twenty-two. Then the one who had been living forever came and pronounced judgment in favor of the people of the supreme God. The time had arrived for God's people to receive royal power. So that's why it says them. I mean, it's, clearly it's under Christ. We, we've already mentioned that. But they are, they are given thrones. It says clearly they are given thrones. Well... This is a judgment that takes on, takes on cosmic proportions, taking place in heaven itself. And it impacts not only the little horn, but also God's faithful people down through the generations. In Daniel 7, we are not given any details about the timing of these events. We will get more details on that in the next two chapters. There will be a pre-advent judgment, which will take place in heaven, and it will favor God's faithful people. How do we know that? Look at verse 22 again. Then the one who had been living forever came and pronounced judgment in favor of who? The people of the supreme God. The time had arrived for God's people to receive royal power. So how should we relate these events, pictured in Daniel 2, 7, and 8, to the great controversy as we understand it? Well, there are several passages in Scripture which appear to discuss how God's judgment takes place. And we obviously could spend a whole several hours discussing the details of these passages. We have Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. What does it say? Joshua, who at that point was the high priest, 
and represented all of God's people, was brought into judgment. Who's accusing him? Satan. Satan, Satan is accusing him. And who's defending him? Jesus. Jesus. And what role does the Father have? He's just overseeing the whole process. It's not God the Father accusing him and Jesus pleading his blood and so forth, that kind of stuff. No, Satan, Satan is the is accuser, accuser and Jesus is the defender. And we read in Daniel 12, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Revelation 12, what does it say? Who is the accuser of the brethren there? Same Satan. 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 It just says specifically. And then a couple of other passages I think we look at a little more carefully, John 3. For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its Savior. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged, because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. I don't, don't know why we don't talk about this verse more often. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds are evil. All those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to be shown up. So what are the evil people doing? They're running away from the light, right? Mm -hmm. What are God's people doing? They're running They're to coming it. to the light. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. So who does the judging? We do. Are we coming toward the light or are we running away from the light? Heaven is self-selected, right? Yeah. You make your own decision, for or against. And Daniel, I mean, keep saying Daniel. John 12, 47 and 48 and, and John 5, 22 support that. A careful review of these verses makes it clear that while the Father in Heaven supervises the judgment, as cases are reviewed, the accuser, Satan himself, tries to make our cases look as bad as possible. In response, Jesus explains why he believes things are not the way Satan has suggested. The entire heavenly council, hundreds of millions of angels, are watching as all of this takes place. God's government is purely transparent. There is no manipulation behind closed doors. Okay? Romans 8. Romans 8 1. There is no condemnation now for those who live in union with Christ Jesus. It comes from the Good News Bible. Okay. How is Jesus' death on the cross related to our living in union with Christ Jesus? I have taken up a mantra, you will, that I think is really important to think about. We have a choice. We can choose to live lives like Jesus lived or we will die the death that Jesus died, separated from his Father. Those are the choices. And we choose to consider ourselves dead uh, as having died with him and that we might be raised with him in newness of life. We yeah. must be born again, as Jesus said yeah. uh, elsewhere. So uh, it's part of the, what has to take place functionally for for the change. Is that called dying to self? You just, you know, you're no longer self-centered. Yeah. And then... Sin, sin has to die. But we live in the light. I love that. Yeah. We live in the light of God's love. Yeah. And we should reflect that. Yes, absolutely. Having viewed the heavenly court scene, we now observe something else interesting. Someone who is described as a son of man or as a human being appears accompanied by his by clouds. And Carrie, I think you have something more on that. Daniel seven thirteen. During this vision in the night I saw what looked like a human being. He was approaching me, surrounded by clouds, and he went to the one who had been living forever and was presented to him again from the Good News Bible. I was watching in the night visions, and behold one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. That's from the New King James Version. So, Son of Man is a Hebrew way of saying human being. Look at Ezekiel 126 and a whole bunch of other passages. You can choose the Old Testament and the New Testament. 
Jesus himself often described himself as a son of man. That is, a human being. In fact, that was his favorite name for himself. Son of man. What does it mean? Human being. He called himself very clearly a human being. So who is, who is this individual that appears and approaches the throne of God in heaven? While he is described as a human being, he obviously exists in the heavenly court, right? Mm -hmm. Furthermore, there are numerous places in Scripture where the Son of Man is described as coming with the clouds of heaven. Guess who that is? It is important to notice that in Daniel 7.13, Jesus is not described as coming to this earth, as was believed in 1843 and 1844, but rather as approaching the throne of God in heaven. Furthermore, he receives dominion and glory and a kingdom, and all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. So remember the sad mistake they made back in 1844, but probably intentional on God's part that he allowed them to make that mistake because it, it caused a lot of excitement, a lot of people to take the Bible seriously and to do some study. Well, by correctly representing the human family before the throne of God, he's able to restore things to the way they should be. It is also important to notice that there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. No Catholic priest can take his place. Amen. Okay, so this little horn representing the Catholic system has made all kinds of boastful claims about its powers and its abilities. Jim? The catechism, this is from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So this is their words speaking to their people. It is in the church that the fullness of the means of salvation has been deposited. Number 824. Basing itself on scripture and tradition, the council teaches that the church, a pilgrim now on earth, is necessary for salvation. Number 846. The church bears in herself the totality of the means of salvation, number 868. There is no offense, however serious, that the church cannot forgive, number 982. Were there no forgiveness of sins in the church, there would be no hope of life to come or eternal liberation, number 983. The sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist with, uh, the Mass, are one single sacrifice. In this divine sacrifice, which is celebrated in the Mass, the same Christ who offered himself once to a bloody, excuse me, in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross is obtained and is offered in an unbloody manner. From uh, something here. Number, three, 13, Number 1367. Part of that Catholic catechism. So they're saying, what have they said in these few passages? We have the ability to forgive sins. We're the only ones who have access to the plan of salvation. So if you're not a Roman Catholic, you cannot be saved. Mm -hmm. That's rather forthright, isn't it? They just take the place of God, basically, yes. right there. And who, who have we just been reading about who tries to take the place of God? Little horn. Little horn. Representing whom? Oh, papacy. Well, the papacy, but who's papacy. really the power behind it? Satan. Satan, Satan. Satan himself. Satan. Who wants to be like God? The Absolutely dragon. Satan. How does it make you feel to recognize that Jesus is the one representing your case in the courts of heaven? If you could sign up a lawyer and pay him for any kind of a fee, who would you want? <laughs> Often it has been suggested that God the Father is a judge and Jesus has to plead his blood before the Father, before the Father is willing to forgive us. Does that mean that Father is not so friendly? Do we need the Son to plead our case before the Father to commit the Father to forgive us? Well, John 14, 9, Jesus says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father, yeah. implying that Jesus is the Father. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't have time to read all this. There's, if you had time, or you could read Daniel 7, 18, and 21 through 22, and 25 and 27. Well, but what's going to be the final result of all these activities of the little horn? 
the power and greatness of all the kingdoms on earth will be given to the people of the supreme God. Their royal power will never end and all rulers on earth will serve and obey them. Yeah. That's, that's, again, them, huh? To me, it should be him. Yeah. Uh. Well, that's, well, I mean, you can see royal power is given to them. So God's p faithful people who remain loyal to him, no matter what the devil does to them, even including persecution and death, will be rewarded by God. But eventually they will be the winners in the great controversy. A victory for Christ is a victory for them. Having seen how history is foretold hundreds of years in advance, and now that it has worked out exactly as predicted, does that help you to trust in the Bible? Mm -hmm. And this is from the Adult uh, Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Friday, February 21st. A cursory uh, look at history reveals that after the collapse of the Roman Empire, which came about by attacks from barbarians from the north, the Bishop of Rome took advantage of the overthrow of three barbarian tribes and established himself as the sole power in Rome as of AD 538. And I interrupt there for just a second. You remember the story that when Constantine became the emperor and declared that the Roman Empire should be a Christian empire, a little while later he decided that he didn't want he was he was much more much more comfortable in the east par, eastern part of his empire than he was in the western part. So he moved, what did he do? Moved he east. He moved the empire, the headquarters of the empire, the Holy Roman, the so-called Holy Roman Empire, from Roman Rome to Constant what he named after himself Constantinople. So technically, the civil authority in the Roman Empire was over in what today would be Istanbul. But in those days, it was called Constantinople. Well, that how long was Con Constantine in Rome? Was he really there? Oh, yeah. Ruling well, for how long? Yeah. He moved I out. thought he was always in Constantinople. No, no. Yeah. No, no. He, he moved the government. <coughs> he moved it himself unintentionally. And when that happened, well, and so a couple hundred years went by, and then there was, um, what was the other guy's name? forgotten right now Justin, the new Justinian Justinian right thank you Justinian decides that okay how are we going to keep things balanced here and he kept giving more and more authority to Bishop of Rome the Bishop of Rome and what happened it grew what, into what we see today on, what we see today you want to go ahead there in this process he adopted uh, several institutional and political functions of the Roman Emperor. From this emerged the papacy, invested with temporal and religious power until it was deposed by Napoleon in 1798. And how did that happen, just to review the history really quick? Well, one of his generals, yeah, Berthier. Berthier, General Berthier, yeah. uh, came and captured the Pope and brought him into uh, France, probably. Napoleon wasn't happy with what the Pope was doing and speaking against him, and so he said, go down and arrest that guy. And he, he was dead within the year. He was an elderly pope. Yeah. And, within, and put him in prison. Within a, within a year, he was dead. Okay? This did not bring an end to Rome, but only to that specific phase of persecution. The pope not only claimed to be the vicar of Christ, but also introduced several doctrines and practices contrary to the Bible. Purgatory, penance, auricular confession, and the change of the Sabbath commandment to Sunday are among many other changes of the times and law introduced by the papacy. Okay, what's purgatory? Just briefly. Place between uh, hell and and the living. Purge of okay. sins. So if you're if you're an almost good enough person, <coughs> you need to have some of your sins still purged. You go to purgatory, mm -hmm. and over if your neighbor, if your friends and family pray for you and give more offerings and so yeah. forth, uh, you can you can get your way out of purgatory. But it's important to recognize that everyone who goes to purgatory will eventually end up in heaven, according to Catholic teaching. Okay, everyone who goes to purgatory will eventually end up in heaven. Okay, what about penance? What's penance? 
Do they still teach purgatory? I yeah, thought they did away with yes. that. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, yes. oh, no. They still believe in purgatory. I mean, I just remember in Luther's day, there was uh, Tetzel, was not the guy that was selling the, yep. the uh, indulgences. Indulgences. So what is auricular confession? Okay, well, That's what's not a that? word. What about, what's penance first? Oh. Offerings and so Offerings, on and so forth. Payments yeah, to, to improve your, your, your chances for salvation. Okay. Take care of sins, just yep. pay, pay it, and they'll and be absolved. And auricular confession means you speak. Auricular. That means you your speak ear. to, you're speaking to the priest, but oh. theoretically you don't know who it is. Yeah. He's there it's sitting behind, and you're talking to, to him through the little cubicle there. Well, it's a new word to me, auricular. It has to do with the ear. Ear. Yeah. Anatomical. Auricular confession. Yeah. So given the identifying characteristics of the little horn in this chapter, is it, is it clear in your mind that this refers to the Roman Catholic Church? Mm -hmm. Sure seems to fit. There's no way it could refer to a pagan Greek king as many critical of the Bible have suggested. Have you ever heard of a pagan Greek king taking confessions from people? Mm -hmm. uh, no. No. <laughs> that pagan Greek king disappeared from history 150 years before the first advent of Jesus. And this is events that are happening after the Roman Empire has fallen the ten kingdoms have risen. After the ten kings have arisen and three of them have rooted up by a, another power of some kind, we, we're calling the papacy, long time later. <coughs> so we have seen in this chapter four main themes. The little horn, the heavenly judgment, <coughs> the son of man, and we've talked about what that means, and the saints of the Most High. So what do we know about the three and a half years of prophetic time that the little horn was to dominate? Jackie? History shows that the conversion of the empire, Emperor Constantine, the official recognition of Sunday as a day of worship, the fall of Rome to barbarians, and the foundation of Constantinople in the East were important factors that favored the rise of the papacy. With the demise of the pagan Western Roman Empire, the Bishop of Rome filled the power vacuum that was created in Rome with the transfer of the capital of the Roman Empire to Constantinople. With I, I remember, excuse me again, I remember I, I took a course called uh, European Civ, European Civilization, back in my days in college. And our, we had a very a great teacher. He was tough, but he was a great teacher. I learned a lot from him. And he would say, that, they called it the Holy Roman Empire. It was not holy. It was not Roman. It was not an empire. That was I, Frank I, Meckling, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah I had, I had. He's him a wonderful too. teacher. He was a great. <laughs> yeah. He's a tough teacher, but boy, he was good. Yeah. Not Roman, not holy, mm, not definitely. an empire. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. With the decree of Emperor Justinian in A.D. 533, made an, made effective only in A.D. 538, declaring the Pope the head of all the churches. The door was open for the papacy to implement its rule. Now the Bishop of Rome held not only religious authority, but also political power. The Pope soon began to call themselves Pontifex. And okay, we're going to stop for a second. What does pontifex. pontifex mean? I don't know. Another word we don't use regularly. Pontifex. Means bridge builder. Oh. Hmm. And what do we call Christ? Mediator. Mediator. What's a mediator? Mediator is a kind of bridge builder. Bridge builder. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Okay. Uh, and adopted other customs and laws of the pagan Roman Empire. By means of alliances with temporal powers, the persecuted church became the pro persecutor. Through the Crusades and the Inquisition, the Roman church inflicted tremendous pain on many who wanted to remain faithful to biblical teachings. And where would you look to hear some of the, you see some of those stories? Oh. What groups? Some of the famous ones. The well, Reformation. The Waldenses. Well, the Waldenses, yes. Yeah. And the Vaudois were the ones that related to them right over on the French side. Yeah. yeah, if you read the stories about those people and what the Catholic Church tried to do to them, just horrendous. Incredible. Uh, one of the stories I like about that is that one time a Roman 
course, they lived way up in those valleys in the, in the um, Piedmont Mountains. And uh, one time a whole big old armed military regiment from the Catholic Church was sent up there to wipe them out. And they kept escaping further and further up into the mountains because they knew their way around in the mountains and so forth. And they were clear up on one ridge and the, and the Roman army thought, okay, there's no way they can escape. It's, it's impossible for them to go out the other side. We'll just get to them now. And in the middle of the night, that whole group, hundreds of people, including small children, walked down the side of that mountain and right through the Roman encampment and up the other side. And when the, when the Romans broke up this next morning, where they, they, of course, they had all their guards, supposedly, and everything there. The next morning, I just saw them, <laughs> that Walden Sea is disappearing over the mountain in the other direction. Mm. Yeah, so stories like that. Mm. So, already during the Middle Ages, the Pope came to be identified with the Antichrist. And there's texts in Matthew, Thessalonians, and Revelation. In 1798, Napoleon put the Pope in prison, bringing to an end the 1,260 years of papal rulership. And that's from the Adult Teachers Sabbath School. Great. Okay, additional details about the Little Horns activities are found in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4, and Re Revelation 13, 1 to 10. I have to read a few of these verses from Revelation. 13, which is just incredible. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads. Does that sound familiar? On each of its horns there was a crown, and each of its heads there was a name which was insulting to God. Mm -hmm. The beast, beast looked like a leopard with feet like a bear's feet and a mouth like a lion's mouth. Have we talked about bears, yes. lions, mm -hmm. leopards? Yes. Right out of Daniel. The dragon gave it the beast his own power, his throne, and his vast authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded, but the wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. How many? The whole earth. Everyone worshipped the dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. Satan. Could we actually reach the place where the whole earth is worshipping Satan? because he had given his authority to the beast. They worshiped the beast also, saying, who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? And I'm going to drop down to verse 7. It was allowed to fight against God's people and to defeat them, and it was given authority over every tribe, nation, language, and race. All people, all people living on earth will worship it, except, whew, thank goodness, except those whose names were written before the creation of the world in the book of the living, which belongs to the lamb that was killed. So if you don't believe God has foreknowledge, you don't have a chance. All right? Yeah. Those names are written in the book before the creation of the world. Now yeah. what text is that? Re Revelation 13, 8. Uh, yeah, 13, 8. Yeah. It should be surprising and shocking to us to realize that virtually everyone in the world will follow after this false God imitator. Okay. Margaret, I think. All right. Yeah. Ellen White talks about several books that presumably are involved in the pre advent judgment. She mentions the following books in connection with this judgment. Number one, the Book of Life, containing the names of those who have accepted the service of God. Number two, the Book of Remembrance, a record of the good deeds of the saints. And number three, a record of sins. This comes from the Great Controversy, page 480 and 81. For the sake of justice and transparency to all those involved in and affected by the final decision, God must conduct an investigation so that no one could cast doubt upon the rightness of the final decision. And this is from Adult Teacher Sabbath School. Okay. So study let's guide. think about this for a moment. God is conducting the judgment. Is he going to be fair? Yes. Does he have to judge against those who judge against him or choose against him? He has to. If you're going to be fair, you have to judge for the righteous and you have to judge against the wicked. You don't, I mean, this isn't a, God, a case of God paying favorites. You know, he has to do what's right. 
What do you do with the text that says, he, Jesus says, I judge no one. It's the words I have spoken yeah. are, are going to be your judge. Yeah, so that's, be, you know, that's the words were spoken in the past. Mm -hmm. So we, we either select for or against God. The yeah. wicked kind of judge themselves. Of course. The choices that they make. That's what we read in John 3, and you can read it yeah. again in John 12. But not so, everything is brought to light. I mean, we don't necessarily see everybody as they, I mean, we, we'll we be won't. surprised that there'll be some people in heaven that we yes. didn't know and, and other people will be lost that we, we would okay. have thought from our human perspective. So God will bring things to light. That's true. However, God will not leave any doubts in the mind of any guardian angel about whether or not this person is safe to save or not safe to save. There, the records will be thorough and transparent. So, I mean, we we. Well, if Colossians one nineteen and twenty and Ephesians one nine and ten and so forth, uh, they were confirmed at the, at that. We say that the heavenly intelligences, the angels, l learned that God's judgment could be trusted. They don't need to go into, into future details. If God said it, they understand it. They have no doubt in their mind. They don't, they don't need to be reminded. Well, I think there's a record that, yeah. but God doesn't have to turn on the uh, computer and and. <laughs> yeah. Well, who is judged in this pre-advent judgment? Now, there are some passages in our Bible study guide, as well as some passages in the Bible and from Ellen White, which seem to suggest, and this is a point of contention. Let, let's be honest, that only the righteous will be judged at this time. That raises a puzzling question. At the second coming, the righteous are taken to heaven and the wicked are left as dead on this earth. That means that the most important decisions are made before the second coming. God doesn't come along, and say, come along later and say, whoops, sorry, made a mistake. I left some people Out down who were supposed to be up here and you, you're not supposed to be up here. Was, you know, he does. Those decisions have to be made before the second coming. Yeah. So. I thought some of them were made before the creation of the world. Yes. I mean, if true. we have a book, it's already there. Things are already decided. Yeah. But, and, and once again, this is the important part. God doesn't say, my word is it, finish, I've decided, here's, I post up a list on the door. Nobody's, there's no, nobody's allowed to ask any questions. No. Anybody who has questions, his questions are answered. I see it more as the Book of Life being everybody's name is in it. Mm -hmm. And then when Joe Blow says, nope, don't want it, they get crossed out or something. Yeah. There's some truth to, to, to that. At least, every, at least everybody who has ever claimed to be a follower of God is there. One important book that is reviewed is called the Book of Life. We've talked about that briefly. Sometimes called the Lamb's Book of Life, where we are told that the names of God's faithful people are recorded from the foundation of the world. There's also a book, and there, there's verses there, there is also a book of remembrance that appears to record all of our deeds and thoughts, and there's a book of the records of the sins of man, and there's passages for that. So once again, if you want all these passages, uh, you don't have a chance to write them down right now, uh, go to our website and you can get our handout. Jesus is the one who is not only capable of associating with us as a human being, Hebrews 2.14 and 4.15, but also is God himself and thus is closely associated with the Father. Thus in this passage we discover that the saints of the Most High are the direct object of persecution by Satan and his little horn surrogate. In other words, what are we saying? We're saying Satan is doing everything he possibly can to get rid of us and Jesus is protecting us, right? Mm -hmm. So thus Seventh-day Adventists believe that the testimony of Jesus is real, revealed by the spirit of prophecy. We are blessed to have had among us one who clearly exhibited that spirit of prophecy. But at the final events of this earth's history, God will need an entire group of people to represent him in the best possible way despite everything Satan throws at them. This will be the final nail in the coffin of Satan's kingdom. Are you comfortable with the idea that at the present time there is a cosmic judgment going on in which your case could be tried? Given what we know about what, who is accusing us and who is representing us, do we have anything to fear? Do we really need to be terrified about what accusations Satan might make against us? God's judgments are completely transparent. 
So if we are living the kind of lives we should be by following the example of Jesus, his rebuttals to Satan's charges will be clear and decisive. Now, let's talk about that for a moment. We didn't have time. This is a long handout, and there's lots of other things we could put in here. But one of the things that we're told in several places by Ellen White is that the plan of salvation will remain our study for the rest of eternity. Mm -hmm. Okay? If the plan of salvation is our, is our study, uh, there's still going to be records of sin somewhere. If a little child comes up like in that famous painting and points to the scars in Jesus' hand and says, how did you get those scars? Is he going to say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't remember. A lot of people think that all record of sin is going to be wiped out. If all the record of sin is going to be wiped out, Jesus is not going to know how he got those scars in his hand. That doesn't make any sense. Well, at so, the end of Isaiah yeah. also, they, you know, talks about from one new moon to the other. Uh, sure. And then they will go forth and look at the corpse of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die, oh, etc. In other words, there'll be a, a place to go to see what happened to those who, you know, uh, yes. who did not choose to be there. That sounds like they won't, won't be completely destroyed. Well, alive. if you depends on how you interpret that. But well, we're running out of you time. Need to re, you, we're running out of time, but you, you need to read the next verse. What does the next verse say? What is destroyed is dead bodies. I don't think well, we'll, we won't need to go anywhere and look at those. No, and we won't Sorry. be. They will be, Malachi 4 says, there will be nothing left except ashes. Okay? So it does not make sense for us to carry on our sinful habits in view of all, this, all that is going on in heaven. There's so many people, that, and you think about the songs, and you think about all kinds of stuff. Everybody wants to talk about, oh, isn't it, we shouldn't be so thankful that God forgives us, and that's true. But unfortunately for a lot of people, the idea is, well, if God forgives us, then we can go back and continue sinning. No. And that's not God's plan at all. So, does our study today make you want to live a better life? I hope so. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to serve you and to know how fair and wonderful your judgment is, to know that you knew about these things and even have names written in books from back before this world was created. We know that many people are troubled by the idea that you have foreknowledge. We are not troubled by that knowledge. We now we ask that you will guide us as we plan our future lives, that we may live in accordance with your plan, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.